With the recent test of a North Korean ICBM over the Western Pacific, the mainstream media is abuzz with talk of atomic attack against U.S. territory, particularly Guam. Now, most of it has been pointlessly alarmist, including, incredibly, a CNN video report advising Hawaiians how to protect themselves against nuclear attack. Now, what CNN and the other mainstream media companies didn't do, however, was consult anyone with an engineering background. If they had, the story would have been a lot less frightening. This is America's first attempt to produce a workable ICBM, the Convair Atlas. Beginning in 1955, this missile had a number one national priority, cost billions, and produced an unreliable but minimally credible missile after five years of intense industry-wide effort. It would only serve for four years before being replaced by more advanced ICBMs, but the engineering for long-range missiles that deliver atomic weapons was by then fully understood. Put simply, it's extremely difficult to explode an atomic bomb over a city halfway across the planet. ICBMs, like all ballistic missiles, are essentially big cannon. The booster in the second stage of the missile loft the warhead on an arcing trajectory out of the atmosphere, where the warhead separates from the spent second stage and falls under the influence of gravity until it encounters the atmosphere. To get through the atmosphere, re-entry is the same process we know for re-entry of manned spacecraft, that is, a fireball, as the kinetic energy imparted by the boost phase is scrubbed off through frictional heating in the air. Now, advanced technologies have some ability to maneuver these warheads, but that stage of development is unlikely in North Korea. The problems are many. Guiding the launch vehicle into the correct trajectory is the essential first step. The boost phase is most important in this part of the process, and getting the missile into the correct trajectory is far from easy. Early missiles used radio command guidance, where widely spaced radars tracked the ascent of the missile and ground-based computers sent radio commands to steer gimbling engines or vernier rocket motors, essentially nudging the stack into the correct direction. A more effective and less jammable guidance technique is called inertial guidance. With this system, a series of gyroscopes are used to create an onboard, stable inertial platform which, when combined with accelerometers, can be used to provide steering inputs for the missile. Now, of course, this assumes the exact location of the missile starting point is pre-programmed. Inertial guidance is much more difficult compared to radio command guidance, but once the missile is launched, it's essentially unjammable. Now, once out of the atmosphere, the warhead has to separate successfully from the second stage without causing it to tumble or lose stability. Then, once the warhead falls toward the atmosphere, it must orient itself with its heat shield downward, either through aerodynamic forces or a reaction control system guided by gyros or horizon scanners. Then the warhead has to survive the trip through the atmosphere using a heat shield designed to ablate or progressively erode to carry away the frictional heat while maintaining temperatures within the warhead low enough to protect sensitive electronics and the bomb itself. Then, if it survives this, it has to have some mechanism to explode the bomb at a predetermined height above the surface of the target, likely using a radar and barometric fusing system unless it's designed to explode on impact, which is unlikely if the attack is intended to inflict maximum damage. And of course, the bomb itself has to work, which despite scary media reports is far from a certainty. Seismic readings of past tests are suspiciously low in yield, low enough to suspect a fizzle more than a bang. And miniaturizing a warhead into a form light enough to be carried by a large ICBM is a formidable task by itself. The notion that one of the world's poorest countries, unable to even feed itself properly, can simultaneously develop miniaturized atomic bombs and multi-stage intercontinental ballistic missiles to carry them is at best difficult to believe. If the goal is to hit a major American city, why not just pack a big, heavy, crude atomic bomb into a 40-foot container and ship it to Los Angeles or New York City disguised as a load of flat-screen TVs? When you go home tonight, drive carefully, because the likelihood that you lose your life on the interstate is higher by orders of magnitude than the risk of a North Korean atomic bomb.